read the Bible in a year or um, mm -hmm. yeah. read as, like read as much of it as possible. Let's read the whole thing. And what I was telling them is that's not a good goal because it's almost like listening to that pro proclamation sermon again, as opposed to the, the question sermon. The text doesn't get in you. You're not doing anything with it. You're just rushing past it. Comics, look out, tell them, look out for my worldview. Cloudy when you sinking, got you thinking it's a whirlpool. Caesar in your pockets, you can't see who's in your pockets. But Stevie's inner visions touch your eyes and make the world move. Wifey bob her head and make her curls move. Crown jewel is character, and this ain't immortality with fairy dust. Never land. Welcome never to the Belfast Podcast, dedicated to those deconstructing and reconstructing their faith. Uh, got another episode uh this is coming a bit late for you guys um, i was doing some traveling over the weekend um and i got a bunch of papers right for school right now so i apologize for that but got some shorter form stuff i want to i want to publish soon as well but uh i had another podcast episode with daniel and as always it was a pleasure um we didn't get to the thing that we wanted to talk about as a main subject because the conversation trailed off in other areas, which was okay. Uh, and it was, it was, it was quite a lot of fun. We talked about um, some ways to study the Bible. We talked about uh, some ways to stay humble, uh, which is something I struggle with. Um, so uh, everything that I say in that notion is something I, I try to do, but I'm not very good at. But it was it was good, and then we talked about um, some different ways to look at inspiration, some ways that that um, that that inspiration is construed in in, in systematic theology. Specifically, uh, I use my textbook from my class, my Erickson systematic theology textbook, to talk about some of that. So uh, it it was it was a good time, and I think the conversation went well. Um, talk about some of the nature of the way we. We teach the Bible. We talk about the Bible from the pulpit in in, in many churches, uh, which which I, I hope I hope it's interesting. You know, you don't have to agree with me, but but it was it was fun. It's some some stuff I've been thinking about for a while um, with with other friends as well. But all that being said, uh, I hope you guys enjoy this one. Oh, a quick quick note about the the audio quality. So I don't know what happened. Um, but um, whatever did happen, my my microphone uh, was not on, or 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 the settings got switched somehow, and I didn't realize it. So my audio in in this interview and in this conversation is being recorded through my my MacBook. Um, so it's not. Uh, so I just apologize for the, the the quality. It's it's not as good as it usually is. Um, I'm gonna do some things in post to help help make it um, make it listenable and make it make it clear um but uh it was a lesson learned in that when i went back to to watch through it again and i was like oh wow my my quality my audio quality was was using my my laptop speakers and not my my microphone so that was that was fun to find out and so yeah i'm gonna do my best to to make it good to make it listenable to make it clear um but i apologize for that next time that will get fixed so um so yeah, just a note on that um, before you before we get into the conversation. But as always, I hope that you guys find this interesting. You find it compelling. Um, you find it um, challenging and helpful. And if you do find it challenging, helpful, and interesting, uh, please give me a, give me a like. Uh, put a comment down there uh, for something that you found you found helpful or something you disagreed with. Uh, and then uh, subscribe, please. I'm trying to reach a hundred. Uh, by the end of the month, I'm at 66, I think now. So it's tall order uh, to get, you know, 30, 34 uh, uh, subs in, in like 15 days. But but we'll see. We'll see if we can do it. And, you know, I, I appreciate everyone who's been with me, who's been listening, who's finding, who's maybe finding this for the first time, um, who who's finding who's finding what I'm doing helpful. That is the biggest the biggest compliment anyone can ever pay me. It, it shows me that I'm, I'm doing something that's worthwhile. Something that's actually helping. Cause that's my end goal. It's not a subscriber count. It's not, it's not a, you know, a certain level of notoriety, although all those things are nice and, and honestly desirable, but at the end of the day to hear that 
uh, people are finding this, people are enjoying it, people are, are, are getting something from it, it's helping, is, is the biggest thing. And so I hope it's doing all that. And if it is doing all that, you can, you can show me that by, by leaving a comment, by subscribing, by emailing me, by, um, by, by listening. So um, thank you all for doing that. And um, I guess I will see you in the next one. All right. Well, we're back again. Daniel was off last week because he had a birthday. So everybody yeah. wish him happy belated. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, what, 25 now? Yep. Getting up on up there. It's uh, gray hairs. In certain. July. So you're six months older than me, which I was honestly shocked when I heard that you were 24 when we first met. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I thought you were like 28 or something. Oh, really? Why? Like I, thought, I definitely thought you were older. Uh, oh, you just look older, not in any bad way. Yeah, um, I get that a lot. I know. I guess I just assume everyone's older than me. Yeah. yeah Everyone with a beard. Besides my roommate, Matt, you hear, you heard that. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah. Oh, some other interesting stuff you, you uh, we were messaging about uh, during last week. You started reading Paul and Palestinian Judaism, which I brought up I did. Uh, last time on the podcast. So how, how far are you? What do you think so far? Um, I'm through the introduction. So I have to say, the um, I got the 40th anniversary edition. That's what I have. The forward to that is absolutely phenomenal. It is a very concise way, I think, of framing the entire conversation about the new perspective on Paul as it's developed yeah. within the 40 years from the time the book was published initially till when the um, when this 40th edition was published. So, um, or 40th anniversary edition. So I really liked that because it allowed me to frame the scholarship as it exists currently and it also allowed me to sort of understand when this book was written, the context of scholarship at that time. So I think mm -hmm. that's really helpful going into it. Like I said, I've only gotten through the introduction right now. It's been a busy couple of weeks, um, but I plan on trying to get pretty deep into that before the start of the semester. I don't think I'll have time to finish it, but uh, my goal yeah, is to I've, through it. I've been, I've been thinking, you know, I brought the question up to you last last time we talked about how do I juggle, you know, these great things within my field that I think I should be reading. And I think the conclusion, I don't know if I shared this on the podcast, but I think the conclusion that I came to was I want to make a short list of like 10, 10 great works, you know, across across the board in New Testament, Old Testament, um, you know, certain specific areas within those that you know, I should read um, and see if, you know, during the times that I do have breaks from school or, you know, just if I have extra things that I can pick up, yeah. um, you know, if I can get those in during the next year and a half that I'm in, in seminary. So I don't think, I don't know, people might think that sounds lofty, but I don't think that sounds too lofty, 10 books in the next year and a half. Yeah. Um, I have easily been reading 20, 25 books a year for the past couple of years. So, yeah, I mean, I'm in the middle of one, two, three books right now. Oh, wow. Um, I'm not counting Unseen Realm because I am not rereading it yet for the podcast. So sorry to everybody who's waiting for those episodes. Um, I'm talking to you, Jason Kadoshnik. Um I will, I will let you know when I get those. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah. So like I'm reading Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, Incarnation Inspiration by uh, Pete Enns for a uh, research for a paper on inspiration I'm trying to write for my theology class. I'm reading the second in Heiser's sci-fi series as well. On top of a book review I need to finish this week for Mission of God by like Friday, Saturday, that's a lot started. Um, that's a little 
little little secret is I probably read four chapters and then <laughs> I do the little five question quiz there enough that I can actually answer it and give you, you know, the general, yeah, you know, thinking of the book. Yeah. Uh, but and even at that, most of the books I've had for that class are not very complicated. They're, you know, yeah, three, 200, 300 pages. If I'm really diligent, read them for a few hours a day, I can finish them in three or four days. Yeah. Um, you know, that's why I try and work hard to knock out most of my stuff. You know, the first couple of days of the week so that I have those that cushion and now you know I have four three papers I need to write before the uh, you know second week of August yeah uh, that I haven't started that are going to be dedicated to Wednesday Thursday and Friday there you go um, yeah my first semester of div school I was writing um, literally a paper a week for the first how long uh, three single spaced pages oh, it's not too bad it wasn't it wasn't horrible but that in addition to the reading that i had to do in order to be prepared yeah. for those papers was insane what's really funny is i'll have you know discussion boards or you know read responses and my read responses and discussion boards are usually 800 to 1500 words <laughs> yeah i got As well. all right maybe <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll have a few classmates who hear this, but I thought it was really interesting. So uh, we talked about this is, I mean, people who've been following my Genesis series will know, but uh, so we had to talk about human origins in my systematic theology class. And the question that was posed for the discussion board that is for, you know, all 15 people in my class was the question of human origins, Adam and Eve, and specifically historical Adam and Eve. Now, I don't, we can get to this more poignantly at another episode that we yeah. have together if we want to discuss historical Adam and Eve. But my position was, I, I don't think it matters. Yeah. Uh, and then I went on to explain it in like 1200 words, why? Why I, why I don't think it matters for our theology. Yeah. I use those words very carefully. Mm -hmm. If Adam and Eve are or are not historical. I don't think that's how they're treated in the biblical text in the beginning. Uh, I like what John Walton says, they're treated as archetypal. Um, I, I think it's, I think you have to do as much, as much eisegesis to the text in Genesis to say that they're literal as you have to do to Paul to eisegete, that you think he's thinking of a literal Adam. I think that's fair. Yeah, because the question is always, how does Paul think about Adam? And it's like chasing the ghost of a ghost, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and when you when you it's like unconscious biases, like okay, thanks, like very helpful. Yeah, right. No, no, you're you're so right. When uh, when I listened to your your video on that while I was driving somewhere, um, I remember thinking, I think this was actually before we. We got connected too. Um, I remember thinking, yeah, this is this makes a lot of sense because I, I still wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do with that question, but I was leaning in that direction, and you just kind of pushed me over that edge. Um, so yeah, it was. I mean, really got to the good content in that series that really like made me think that. Um, and to people's maybe not surprised, but thank you, Tim Mackey. Like he's he's the one that pushed me there. Um, yeah. not necessarily in his thoughts on Paul's interpretation. I haven't heard him talk about that specifically, yeah. but, um, have you seen, to just finish this real quick. Have yeah. you seen the show Chernobyl no, on I HBO? No. Okay. Fantastic show. And I'm sorry you haven't seen it because this analogy will not hit you as well. It's fine. Um, although I will try to explain it. So Chernobyl is about the, uh, nuclear plant explosion that happened in Germany in Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was in the 40s or the 50s. Don't take that as gospel. Someone in the comments, uh, you know, Blow you up educate me on when it happened because I don't remember. I watched the show when COVID started with my family. Um, it's five five episodes. They're about an hour an episode. It's a mini series. Yeah. You'll finish it in a day. If you don't finish it that first day, you'll finish it the second day. 
Gotcha. Um, you can get HBO Max on Hulu if you already have it for a week for free. Um, so, yeah. It is also like the biggest punch to communism ever. And it is. Wow. There's a wonderful, wonder. I won't give anything away, but there's a wonderful scene at the end yeah. where the main character is talking about the construction of the nuclear plant. And he talks about, he gives us, basically gives a very Peterson-esque spiel about telling the truth. Yeah. And he says, the longer we don't tell the truth, the more we incur a debt. Like the longer we lie, the more we incur a debt to the truth. And so like the bigger that debt becomes, the bigger the price we pay. Yeah. Ooh. And it's so good. That is. Um, but anyway, for, in the show itself, in the HBO series, Chernobyl, you have the two main, and uh, sorry, if I wanted to pull up my paper, I could read them and butcher the German names, um, but I'm not going to. Uh, but you have the two uh, main scientists who are real historical people who were part of the government at the time. And um, actually, sorry, I might be totally talking out of my butt. Um, I keep saying German and I don't think it's German. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid. It was in Ukraine, it was in Russia. I was like, communism, Germany. Germany is like the opposite of communism. Yeah. <laughs> and, I was like, and around <laughs> World War II. <laughs> Come on, Luke, know your history. All right, it was in, it was in Ukraine. My bad. I apologize to all the history buffs out there who were just like my dad, who'd be banging his head against the wall. But, like his son, like said communism in Germany in the same sense and didn't understand that he was totally incorrect. Um, you fix it. All right. So, so sorry. So, like, fact check myself. All right. Yeah. Um, so, like, I could pull up my paper or like the cast list and read these like Ukrainian Russian names and totally butcher them, but I will not. Um, so you have the two main scientists in, in the story who are real people yeah. who were part of the government at the time who were asked to investigate what happened and give a report. And then yeah. you have this other lady who's a scientist who works at a plant hundreds of miles away who starts seeing interesting things going on in her readings and is like really curious about, she's, oh, maybe there was an explosion. So like she goes to Chernobyl and starts starts investigating and teams up with these two two guys yeah all right well here's the thing that one lady scientist at the end of the series they play you know footage and it's like oh yeah so like here's footage of the actual thing here's information about these people who were in the show here's who these characters are you know here's pictures of them in real life and something really interesting happens. So the lady scientist is that says she actually didn't exist. She, her as a character, is an amalgamation of 12 scientists that helped these two um, you know, government officials investigate yeah. the plant explosion. Yeah. Okay. But then if I watch the show and I ask, is this girl real? I don't think that question really matters. Yeah. I don't, I like, I don't think it gets at the point. Yeah. Because like, is she a literal person? Well, no, but she represents, she's a, like a, she's a story, like fictional, not even fiction, fictional is not even the right word for something like this. She's yeah. archetypal of yeah. these 12 scientists. Yeah. I think when Paul talks about Adam and Adam's sin, that's how he's talking about Adam. Yeah. Well, I think Adam could be real. I'm totally fine with yes. there being a genealogical, as, as Swami Das has pointed out, Adam and Eve. Yeah. I'm totally real, cool with evidence coming out about like, yep. yes, Adam and Eve are literal people. Yeah. I, I still think you have to do just as much eisegesis as I just did mm -hmm. to... Paul and Adam and God, even more Genesis 1, to prove that Adam and Eve are literal people, to say that they're archetypal or they're Paul's treating like 
now you could ask the question, is Paul treating Adam as a, as a typographical character, which would then imply some historicity to him or just archetype, which doesn't necessarily imply history or not. Yeah. Um, which, oh, uh, sorry, archetype doesn't necessarily imply history. Yeah. Like historical, gra historical grounding. Uh, yeah, and I just think to, to argue a literal Adam and Eve from Genesis 1 and 2 is like bonkers at this point. The, 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 the text, the waters that text is swimming in have nothing to do with biological origin. Nothing. Well, that and they do represent, like, so talking about something that happened historically, factually, has no bearing on how you read that thing in the story yeah. inherently. So what I mean by that is I can say, um, I can describe the same sunset in two different ways, right? I can say the sun rose seven meters from the horizon in the course of two hours. Or I can say the sun graced the earth with its presence as beams of light shot over the horizon. Those are two ways of describing the exact same thing, right? And both of those ways is equally true. But you don't get the same feeling mm -hmm. or even the same knowledge depending on which frame you use. And so even if Adam and Eve are real historical people who existed six-ish thousand years ago, whom we all descended from, or a portion of us descended from, or they're worked into our you know, genetics somehow, whatever. The, you still have to treat the story like a story yeah. in order to get theological yeah. meaning from it. Yeah, this is why when I wrote my initial post, I said, do they matter for our theology? Yeah. And I said, I don't think so. Exactly. Because the and I got chewed up, but not because people were like tearing apart my argument, just because people were mad. Yeah. That I yeah. said Adam and Eve maybe not existed, like it doesn't matter. Yeah. And everyone was like, no, they have to matter. And it got it initially it like it initially boiled down to, well, if Adam and Eve aren't real, then like <clears throat> there's no need for Jesus, which Pete ends has a great video on that. Yeah. Um, and like, a, I think a total misunderstanding of original sin and yep. Yep. Like, so yeah, but, first Corinthians 15 and Romans five twelve. like, it's not about guilt. We don't have, we don't inherit Adam's guilt. No. We inherit death, which we are then born into a world where sin, we are going to sin. Yeah, but it's not because we're guilty. It's because we we're sinful. Make our, we make our own guilt all the time. We make our own sin and and stuff that we have to. And then you know you get into atonement theories and all of that. And so yeah. that's a whole nother conversation and one that I'm not as well versed in as I want to be. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, it's just anyway. So that was like I don't yeah. know what made that come up, but yeah, yeah. that was it. Was just Good like time. a thing where I'm like every now and again i'm just like we talked about this for you know but it's just one of those ones where i'm like yeah i'm the theological liberal in my class that this is fun this is I, you fun. know <laughs> i'm the theological it's, it's so weird I, I think i mentioned this to you as well because i think i'm the theological conservative in my class yeah but but when I'm in a theologically conservative class, then I'm a theological liberal. It's like depend, like no one wants to claim me, and I'm just getting ping ponged back and forth between the two of them. Yeah, I'm too. I always say this, man. I'm too. I'm too liberal for my conservative friends or family, and I'm too too uh, conservative for like my liberal friends. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. we'll yeah. find that out later in this podcast too. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You talk about Paul and Palestinian Judaism. I had a, I, I got this from my bookshelf because I wanted to show it to you. Yeah. Um, I have a recommendation for you to read once you okay. finish that book. Yeah. It'll be way easier for you to read. You'll finish it pretty quickly. 
uh, and that is N.T. Wright's biography of Paul. Paul, yeah. Yes. Um, I've read now, I haven't been a big bi biography reader in the past. Uh, I've now read four or five biographies. I've read Bonhoeffer. I read Metaxas's Bonhoeffer biography. Mm -hmm. And um, I read, uh, I made a video about this. I read Robert Lancer Green's, or Roger Lancer, I don't remember. Uh, Green's uh, biography of Lewis and uh, Metax, not Metaxas, um, McGrath's biography of Lewis. Um, and then I've also read this biography. Gotcha. This biography, quick pitch, is maybe the most beautifully written. Wow. It's almost like biographical fiction at some level. Yeah. Not in terms of Wright's arguments or anything or his perspective necessarily, yeah. uh, but simply because of how he writes about all doing certain things. Yeah. They, it's, yeah. It There's so many biographies will just give you, yeah, they went to this place and did such and such and so and so and like, yeah. um, or, you know, they traveled here for a couple months and this happened and that happened, but it's so much, it's information. Whereas Wright is giving you scenes. He's, he's painting scenes for you about certain things that are going on. Yeah. Oh, so it's very enjoyable. And the whole book, the whole book is worth, is worth the last chapter uh, that is called The Challenge of Paul. It's like 30 pages. Yeah, the price of the book is worth the price of the book. Worth, worth, the last chapter. Wow. Okay. Um, I'll have to see if I can find that. So yeah, I bought. I want to get the paperback. A because I like paperbacks more. B because I ripped the binding. Of my, sure did. Of my hardback, and I'm sad about it. Dang. So yeah, wonderful, wonderful biography. I yeah. recommend to anybody who's interested in Paul. And if you want something that's not theologically dense necessarily, that just tells the story yeah. um, and tells it beautifully, pick it up, man. Um, I didn't look how much it is on Amazon. I would assume non-Kindle version is like twelve to fifteen dollars. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah, I'll have to maneuver my way through uh, the E.P. Sanders book first. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I say after, because it might, after having learned about all of that, it might even, you might even have some interesting, you know, insights you pull. Yeah, no, I'm sure that, that sounds really like a good pair. Um, yeah, so, but it's always fun to talk, about, talk to somebody who, you know, knows more than you, I feel like. Yeah. Um, so speaking of that, I actually had a question for you. Mm -hmm. So as someone who is really well-versed in Christian study um, and really... Oh, there's so much I don't know. Yeah. I mean, there's obviously so much that you and I both don't know. Yeah. Um, but we because we're in school for this, we tend to know more than the general population, or at least have thought through things. I mean, we're writing papers, we're spending time researching and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we've been a bit more intentional generally. It's not even that we know more, but we've been a bit more intentional in our studies than the vast majority of people you'd meet on the street, right? Yeah. Um, even Christians you meet on the street or in church on an average Sunday morning. So I'm just curious, have you ever been in a situation, a discussion, maybe a disagreement even with someone who doesn't have the, um, I guess the, the background of education that you do and you, you're struggling to not come across as like arrogant or, um, hostile or like a know-it-all when you have a bit more experience in the specific topic you guys are talking about yeah um uh 
I mean, it, I think some of it depends on the context of the dispute, right? If it's yeah, yeah. If it's somebody that I see, you know, twice a year at Thanksgiving and Christmas, I don't know if it's worth a big discussion, right? You feel like there's some backstory there? No, no, that was literally <laughs> a random example. Yeah. Um, but if it's like my uncle, my aunt and uncle, who yeah. I see, well, now I, I live in Springfield, so I'm not seeing them as much. Yeah. I was seeing them when I lived in Lee Summit. Three, yeah. Two, three times a week, we have you know family dinners together. They live in the same city as my family. Yeah. Right. We get into discussions. We disagree. Yeah. Uh, you know, our dinner table is a big debate room. So, you know, it's usually fun and like not not very hostile, but it can get heated, yeah. or I should say, I get heated. <laughs> and um, I I think this is the goal in any communication that you have. Um, is using this is why i love using film or tv analogies yeah now you know if no one's seen what you're referencing it doesn't really help yeah but um they're they're great doors to enter through um mm -hmm. and i say that because using something that someone might know or can wrap their head around as a I mean, and you could argue that the way the Bible talks about so many things is just an analogous nature, right? Because we can't grasp it. Yeah. So I think there's some humility there in knowing that, like, look, all these analogies we're going to use are going to fail at some level, right? Yeah. We yeah, can, yeah. We can have better ones than others. Uh, but using something that they, so like part of it, part of it is understanding where they are. So mm -hmm. then you can use you can be like okay i know you've said maybe x y and z about this or you brought up this passage or you're really hung up on on like this specific thing about whatever yeah so like we can i can talk about that and maybe give you a different spin on that subject so that as you talk about it it can they can like spin around it yeah. like, oh i never thought about that part yeah right yeah um of of this specific thing, which can which is this is part of my like desire in the Genesis series is right mm -hmm. take specific pieces of content that push me in certain directions and I'm trying to do it in the chronology that happened to me. Yeah. So that you can see how things shift and turn mm -hmm. as I begin to think about them. Yeah. And I've come to the conclusion that you guys just heard me talk about. Um well, so, yeah and that makes yeah, sense. Yeah I think I think something of but just just speak not as broadly uh like knowing knowing where they're at picking you know whatever topic it might be that you all disagree on right like yeah. i we'll talk about inspiration later but like i have fights with family members about the nate like and we will we'll get into this but I, I mentioned this the last time we talked how you think about inspiration informs how you think about inerrancy or the formation of the bible yeah that's right true. um so something that was really good that i think my when my family had a bama group before we ever got into bama we watched tim mackie has a he has two different ones that i've seen online um he probably has done more than these but there's two prominent ones yeah. uh about the making of the bible so like two hour lectures about the history of the formation of the text itself. Yeah, I haven't seen those, but I really wanted to watch them. Uh, yeah, I would recommend. Um, the one where he's in like a red, he wears like a red shirt in one and a blue shirt in the other. Uh, yeah. I like the one where he's in the red shirt as a lecturer more. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the one my group watched. Uh, sure. The one where he's in the blue shirt is where he gives the Q&A and then he makes some really dangerous comments at the end about Adam and Eve. <laughs> um i think i've seen bits and pieces of yeah, that yeah i played that for the for my first yeah first. yeah um but anyway so like recommend them highly uh but that was helped seemed to be really helpful for yeah. people in our group because it was like okay before we talk about the book let's talk about how we that, like the book itself how we got it right 
Um, as Andy Stanley famously said, and I like this quote a lot, a lot of us know stories in the Bible, but we don't know the story of the Bible. And I would argue it's almost just as important that we know how we got the Bible than in the Bible. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, or at least know what you believe about that mm -hmm. in detail. Because like I was talking about a couple weeks ago when we were having our, I think our first conversation, you know, we oftentimes have this subconscious view that the Bible fell out of the sky, leather bound in yeah. with golden ink and all of its glory holistically. And that might not be something that we actually believe, but that's something that we say we believe and, or, or we act like we believe, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like we might not tell people, Hey, this is what I think, but that's something that we we behave as though it's true. And so, yeah. So, like, really sit down and think about that question and try to clarify exactly how the Bible came into existence is an important one. Yeah. A very important one. Yeah. Um, you ask about how do you stay humble? Uh, yeah. Or, like, I mean, even. I mean, humble to yourself, but also make yeah. sure you're coming across as a jerk, right? Because I don't think... Yeah. This is something that. This is something that, um, funny enough, this is something I think Peterson exemplifies really well, even yeah. with how astronomically smart he is. I can agree. Because, she, and here's, here's the thing, and here's why I think his lectures on the Bible have garnered millions of views, and churches fail to get full attendance. Here's one of the big things I think he's doing. And um, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, the the Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox guy, Dr. Um, he's actual friends with. Um, his name will come to me in a minute. Yeah. But what you see Peterson doing in his biblical lectures, which I, again, encourage people to listen to, is I don't agree with him on everything, just to be clear, right? Like, I don't agree with how he thinks about the Bible's existence in general. Um, he is one of those people that takes away the, the like, or at least from what I've heard him say, even his class, he takes away the um, supernatural hand yeah. and le just leaves the... Um, human hand, which I think he would even have trouble with me using those words to define how he thinks about it. But anyway, uh, Jordan, we can talk about that at another point. Um, no, but what you see him doing in his lectures, even about the Bible, even about things that he knows a lot about, he will say more than once, you know, I studied this or I thought this thing, or like, we'll even say, man, it took me 20 years to figure this out, right? Yeah. Or like, yeah. He'll be like, here's my conclusion. I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Right. And this is part of his, the, the thing that he does. Where This isn't so much in his biblical lectures, but when he did his tours, is he would always say, I never prepare. Rarely. Rarely does he have notes. He, well, this is like, uh, like very much like Lewis would lecture, too. He knew his sources so well. He could yeah. just talk about them. Yeah. Um, I have a comment on that maybe later. But... Uh, Oh, as far as Lewis is concerned. But anyway, what Peterson would do is he would sit in the back room, in the green room, for probably an hour. And he's talked about this before. And he would just sit there and he'd think, what's the question I'm going to ask tonight? And he would think about it. And then he'd maybe think about, you know, some general things he wants to say. And then he'd go on stage and he'd talk. Yeah. And he's like, he's like a freestyle rapper, a crowd work comedian. Like, yeah, that's what he's doing. But why I bring that up is, even the nature of his lectures where he's trying to expouse what he's studied for 40 years. Mm -hmm. He's like, I am on this journey of discovery with you as an audience, because I am not pre-planning what I'm saying. So I am literally thinking out loud with yeah. you. Yeah. No, you bring up. A that really never good. happens at church. It doesn't. It never does. Um, Never have I heard a pastor. Say, oh, well, okay, sorry. Truth be told, my pastor said this about the Noah story the other week. But rarely, rarely have I heard a pastor say, 
hey, so I'm going to talk about this thing and I really don't know what to do with it, but here are some things that I think are important, yeah. right? Yeah. I yeah. think that if pastors, I'm not saying you aren't, you know, assured of, you know, Christ's resurrection or you don't preach the gospel or you don't share, uh, you know, conviction and truth from, from the text. Within that, I think that the, <clears throat> what gets preached a lot of times on Sunday mornings and what scares me is the certainty with which certain things are said. What I mean by that is here's X pass or, okay, well, I'll go with this because it's a better example. And this isn't a knock to topical churches. My church is doing topical stuff right now. We're going to be doing it for like two more months before we get into Hebrews. Yeah. Anyway, uh, last Sunday, we talked about ambition, by the way, just if you want to know the kind of topics my church. That's interesting. Uh, anyway, so this usually happens with topical things. I've seen, I've seen this. I've sat in pews where this happens. It's, oh, the topic for this week is purity. Or it's, hey, we're doing this, uh, you know, sequential sermon series, but we really want to hit on, you know, X topic in, you know, this book. So is there any way that you can, like, pull this thing out of this text? And it's just like, like, I've literally heard things about, uh, like a, a passage where in within the story, there was, um, I don't remember the text. So if anybody knows if this is comment or let me know, or if you know, let me know. Yep. But uh, the text, there was a story about a king who commits suicide. And, and then the pastor for 20 more minutes talked about the uh, soteriological implications of suicide. And it was like, it, like, let the reader understand that sentence, one. And two, it's like, no, like that. Yeah. You're, you're literally like, you're, you're, uh, I don't like, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't get it. Like, well, you're, you're pulling you're, something out of the text to yeah. make a point that is, you're making something that's like, I'll use words that they would use. You're, you're making something prescriptive that's descriptive in the text right yep. i think that happens way too often even at churches where those phrases are said all the time yeah yeah that's no. what i mean by cert certainty about certain things it's like not yeah. certainty about truth that's being taught it's certainty about the exegetical nature of xyz passage or our homiletical approach to the yep. bible and it's well, like no like we talk about like, here's three ways to be a great dad. And it's like, have you read about the dads in the Bible? Like, yeah, I don't think any of them are examples of what to be. Yeah. Really? At least holistically. Yeah. I mean, you can exactly. say, okay, be like Abraham in this way. Don't be like Abraham in this way. Yes. But you can't say Abraham is a great example of being a father in all of these ways like this is just no this is something great that i love tim does when he'll lecture about people in the bible who'll say good guy bad guy yeah and yeah. then your your audience is like good they'll say like good guy and they'll be like talking about david and be like oh so does a good guy like not go to war when he should and basically demand that one of his officer's wives comes and sleeps with him because he sees her naked and thinks she's beautiful and then, and then ends up that. killing her husband because yeah. he can't deal with committing adultery or like like deal with the rape of his daughter and like you mm -hmm. know all this stuff that's like oh we don't preach about that at church it's like no because like we want to character david as just the dude after god's own heart which he definitely is if you read his psalms but it's like couching David in this pristine picture doesn't help. And well, so, so on that, I mean, David, even at the end of his life, uh, do you watch The Chosen? 
Yeah, I haven't. I have watched half of the second season. Okay, so uh, it is the best Jesus thing I've ever seen, which isn't a high bar, Dallas Jenkins, but you have monumentally surpassed it. So good for you. I agree. I 100 percent agree. <laughs> watched the uh, I watched the season finale last. I got night. I got notifications about it a couple of days ago. It was really good. Um, and I don't always think that they do certain things justice or do things perfectly, but yeah. I, I really love the heart behind it. But one thing that I thought was super interesting was a controversy that was had about midway through the second season. Jesus and John the Baptist have a conversation about David. Um, and John talks about, I don't know if you've seen this episode yet, but John, mm, no. talks about, um, I'll be paying attention for it. John talks about how at the end of David's life, um, he feels really cold while he's in bed. There's a story towards the yeah, end yeah, yeah, yeah. Life where he feels really, really cold in bed. So they get a young girl, virgin girl, to go and sleep in his bed to warm him. Yeah, to keep him warm. Yeah, and John sort of gives, John the Baptist, sort of gives these air quotes. Um, he's like, yeah, that's really what happened. Um, and then Jesus in the story is like, well, that's what the text says. Um, and so you have these two interesting little like, yeah. ideological yeah. positions yeah. posed in this one scene, and it caused a lot of controversy. They got a lot of backlash for it, but I thought it was super interesting because you have this one perspective that's like, okay, but I can read between the lines there. Yeah. And you have other perspective that's saying that's what the text says in black and white. Yeah. And then, I do think there's a tension there between those two extremes that you sort of yeah. have to read between. But anytime you, you're you reading a text, especially if it's presenting itself in some semblance of a historical fashion, there, I mean, you have to play within that tension. Yeah. So I think that's a great example of, of what you're talking about. I mean, that's, that's kind of a, a sketchy. sketchy yeah. um, but no, so back to like my, my initial point, which was on humility. Yeah. I, I ultimately think that uh, um, the part of what drives, uh, and I've had debates with some friends about this, what drives like the things that my church can get accused of is that there's not enough proclamation of the word because you have to keep in mind, my pastor is a teacher that's been his trade. He is big in philosophy. He teaches the Bible is lit in, in like a school in Ozark. He, he teaches like intro to philosophy. And it's like, not that truth isn't spoken and not that hard stances aren't taken on things like homosexuality, but like, if you mean like, it's just that there's often his model is way more let's ask great questions than like let's give everybody answers. Yeah. I love that because yeah. it's like then then I'm left thinking about it for a week actually mm -hmm. than just being like, oh, that great statement he made that I'm gonna forget in three months. Yep. And not to say like there's statements that my pastors made that have made me reshape how I think about relationships or my approach to the Bible or any of these things. Um like very practical things that that I'm appreciative of, but more so it's just like he'll beg a lot of questions. Yeah. And so I have friends that are like, man, I I want the proclamation. And I'm like, yeah, but many times the like proclamation that you're getting is one of five major ways that that specific thing is interpreted. Well, that and does it really get in you? And if if you agree with it already before he said it, then you didn't need to hear it. Yeah. Right. So th there was no point in listening to the sermon at all because it didn't change you. It just, it's confirmation bias. You just heard what you've already believed beforehand. And that's one of the things that really bothers me about a lot of churches is that when I go in and I listen to a sermon, I'm not being changed by the sermon. I'm letting the sermon reinforce what I already believe. Yeah. And that's not, that's not healthy. I mean, you want to talk about why Jesus was such a great teacher is because he asked good questions. 
we, we all the time get bothered about why didn't Jesus respond with firm answers in the gospels when people ask him questions. And it's because he's trying to make you think about things. He's not spoon feeding you. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is Jesus' yeah. first response? Why do you call me good? Only the father is good. Yeah. Well, and um, what was it that he said? Um, shoot. Give me a second. It was, um, oh, you know, the whole teach disciples ask, why do you teach in parables? And he says, that way not everyone will understand. Yes. I think it's because yes. he didn't want people to get it. It's that he wanted them to have to look for it. Right? He wanted them to have to dig deep and commit. And on Sunday mornings in most churches, you don't have to commit. You don't have to dig deep. You're spoon-fed milk. You're not given meat. And there's a place for milk, right? I mean, Paul talks about that. There's a place yeah. to, to feed people who don't have a base knowledge of things. And, and that's well and good. That's really good, actually. There's a big place for it. But what I think we in the American church have done is gotten complacent in feeding everyone milk and not trying to go deeper. And then you say, well, let's try to go deeper. And then they say, okay, well, let's just bring it back to the gospel. Let's just bring it back to the gospel. And it's like, yes, but Jesus didn't go around only talking about himself. He references the Old Testament. He's building on things. He's using complex. He's debating other religious leaders. He's debating other religious leaders about very complex and hotly debated topics of his day. Um, and so I am 100% for preaching the gospel, 100%. I'm devoting my life to learning about this book that I think is the gospel is the fulcrum point of. But let's be a bit more intellectually stimulating and spiritually stimulating in the way that we do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, again, I, yeah, firmly agree. Uh, part of the humility that comes with that, too, is saying, look, in what I've studied, here's what I've found. Yep. And... What do you it's think? not to say that you're weak, but you're like willing to say, you know, I could be wrong on certain points. Yeah, I don't think I am, but if like this is my point of view. It's like if you're going to give me better evidence to think a different way, I'm like, sure, I'll buy it. Yeah, but like I'm going to need to be convinced, right? Well, um, and so, on, but well, and, and on that, the this willingness to dive deep and ask questions is in itself humble, right? Because it assumes that I don't have all the answers and so I need to find out more things. Yeah, assuming that, uh, so. There's a, uh, I'll tell, uh, I'll put two stories on this that I think are useful, but um, so this is in PN's book. I'm just going to read like a sentence out of this that I thought was really interesting. So, um, so this is in chapter three. He said it's about theological diversity of thoughts of God in the Old Testament. Yeah. Or in the law and in the Psalms and in, and he brings up a number of different things that are, that are diverse or even contradictory. Within, yeah. within there. And he says this, um, this is the beginning of the chapter. While I was in grad school, one of my professors, a traditional Jewish scholar, said something that has stuck with me. This may sound ter uh, terribly self-absorbed, but it was one of those aha moments that generated a process of rethinking a few things. Here's the quote. For Jews, the Bible is a problem to be solved. For Christians, it is a message to be proclaimed. Yeah. And I'm not saying that there's ways to mix those two. Like, obviously, we're called to spread the message of the gospel. Now, whatever yeah. the gospel is, I think it's more complicated than we made it. Mm -hmm. But 
I guess the, the point that his professor was making is an approach to the text that says, look, you have something that I need to find. You have something to teach me that isn't on the surface that I can just then go proclaim. It isn't my soap analogy of scripture, observation, application, and prayer, right? That can be fine, and you can do that. Yeah. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that, that that feeds a certain approach to the text of, oh, I need to read this and then get an application for the day and then, like, pray about it. Yeah. And like, sure, we need to be applying the Bible to our lives. Absolutely. But I think that that fosters a, a surface level um, reading that that doesn't do a lot in the long run. It doesn't, like the things that I've had questions about in the Bible, I've had questions about for 15 years, right? Yeah. I still don't have the answers to some of those. Yeah. Um, my mind's changed so much on Revelation. Don't ask me about it because I don't know. Yeah. Right. Um, like, you know what I'm saying? So it's so, but I'm approaching this with a mindset of these writers, these editors, God's word, God has something to teach me. And it's probably, I probably learned most of the obvious stuff mm -hmm. that I yeah. can. Yeah. So, like, whatever I learn now probably isn't going to be obvious. If you're a young Christian, this is for you if you're a young Christian. If you're like two or three years into your walk, if you're, you know, just became a Christian last summer, you just got handed a Bible, I got some advice for you. Read it like a story. Yep. Re read, read the Gospels. Read the four of them over and over and over again. Read the Gospels for six months. And dedicate yourself to reading maybe 30 minutes a day. Maybe you read more than two chapters, right? I was okay. working on a... There's that's the end of my spiel, but I was working on transition to not straight advice, but like I was working on this thing for my church. It was about something that Marty talks about in his his uh, his episode of Mark, and something that uh, Ray Vanderlaan talks about. Yeah, is the the parallel between the court I've mentioned this before coronation and Jesus yeah. crucifixion. Again, yes. back to the question of is it real? Well, did Jesus really get offered wine mixed with myrrh? Probably not. Yeah. I'm going to bet no. But what is Mark's point? Jesus is greater. That's here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and he's purposefully trying to, in all of the facts about those two narratives that don't line up, he's trying to make enough of them line up to parallel the two and devise a polemic between them. Yes, yeah. make you see them as polar opposites that are opposed to each other, and you have to pick a side. Again, I'm trying to think of a movie example, like like Tarantino is the best shot stealer in the world, right? But he's paying homage to these things, and I'm trying to think of something that like does it in a way that's like antagonistic to the thing it's stealing from, because usually it's you know a gratitude that you steal certain things but anyway i can't think of any so we'll leave that there um, but anyway so i was doing this thing for my church we're trying to draw on that for we have a friday a passion friday experience that we do yeah. i'm going to draw on those parallels um two of the hardest questions we had to ask was why should someone care about this mm -hmm. and we don't have to get there in this episode we have somewhere else to go but the other thing that my friend alex pointed out to me shout out to alex smith uh if you're listening to this love you buddy um but one of the things that he said to me that was just shocking is he was like, I was like, maybe we should just have people read the whole passage before they go into the thing. And he was like, Luke, you're probably you, like, great idea, but we might have people in this congregation that have never read two chapters of the Bible in a row. Like, that's just real. Because how do we, and this is something I'm stealing this from Tim, and I think it's great advice. Like, how do we, this is, again part of the humility how do we interact with the text though usually yeah. it is maybe a chapter on sunday mornings maybe yeah yeah no you're right usually five verses at most yeah um and if they're topical man those verses can come from anywhere anywhere right? yep they're, they're uh they're like the the spongebob rainbow right uh Imagine. but 
Nation. <laughs> uh, but, and then, uh, you know, in the mornings, it's like, oh man, I got to get my quick 10 minutes in, read this passage from yeah. this one book that I'm reading through. And I had a friend who was like, dude, I can't keep track. Right. Yeah. So I was like giving, trying to give him advice on like how to keep track of what you're reading and yeah. all this. But Tim's advice was read it for 30, 45 minutes at a time and read the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah. Because you're going to oh. get things as you read it. Like this is why I think tangent, but like music is so impactful and why like when I make music or my friends make music, the thing that we care about now is, is am I going to replay this? Yeah. Because I know as a, as a writer and as someone who like wants to say things that I think are important or impactful, I know I'm high, I'm, I'm doing what the Jewish authors are doing. I'm hiding things in my songs. I'm hiding lines. I'm hiding references. I'm hiding the way, if I make an album, the way that things in one song coalesce to another song and parallel each other. Right. Yeah. You're never going to get it if you listen to it once. Yeah. Never. Yeah. There's things that in, in Good Kid Mad City that I never understood Kendrick was doing until I listened to it a hundred times. Yeah. But I, I'm willing to because it's so damn good. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do we not say, hey, man, when I read this Bible, it's the best piece of literature ever created. Like it is it. It, it is worthy of my devotion of reading it 30 minutes, 45 minutes a day, reading through, like I read through Jonah twice, like just in one sitting yesterday yeah. morning and this morning, yeah. right? I pulled certain things from the text both times. Mm -hmm. And it's a short book. It's like three pages in my Bible, right? Yeah. Oh, it's um, incredible. You know, if you want to do something simple like that, dude, pick Mark, pick Jonah, pick, I don't know, don't pick Genesis. Um, <laughs> like where you could I don't, I don't care maybe um but I yeah i mean to, um i was talking to i had two conversations within the last 24 hours that really hit on this topic really well um one was with my grandmother and one was with my friend earlier today and both of them sort of hit on the what really what you're talking about and how um really when you read the bible you have to understand you know tim and marty and all them they they talk a lot about cultural context you know but there's also literary context yeah right? yeah there's things that are going on outside the one verse or one passage that you're reading and so uh, my buddy that i was talking to earlier today he said that you have to really be careful about understanding what's going on outside of anything that you're reading. So he believes this so much to the point where he will read, he's been reading through the minor prophets. He'll read the entire prophet in one sitting and just that that's his staple. Yeah. He won't read unless he can read the whole thing in one sitting because reading the whole thing in one sitting is very important or at least reading large chunks of it is very important for understanding how the author is progressing through ideas. Yeah. Even in Psalms, in the book of Psalms, reading the, the whole Psalm is really important. Or in, uh, in the prophets, because of the way that they do, they use poetic, um, poetic alliteration and illusion, right? reading the whole thing is important because like you're saying, you can, you can listen to that Kendrick song over and over and over again and never really pick up on what he's doing until you've heard it the hundredth time with like the whole thing, the hundredth time, and you see all the dots that are connecting. Yep. Parallelism is how Hebrew poetry works. And so in order to understand the parallelisms and pick up on what the author is doing, you really, really have to see the thing holistically and then slowly begin to pick apart the parts. Yeah. So, and yeah, this is my fear when I talk to you about not knowing the story is like, we love to pick the parts, but we don't love, we don't know the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so we've gotten, and picking apart the parts is an important thing to do. 
yes. but only after you've examined the thing as a whole, because you have to understand what the thing as a whole is trying to accomplish in order to accurately understand what those individual pieces are doing. Yeah. And to go beyond this, I would say anytime you're reading any um, English translation, I may have already said this before, um, you have to you have to understand that the, the English is not what the Hebrew says. Yeah. The English is trying to capture what the Hebrew says, but it's not it holistically. So I can go ahead and go off on my translation rant. Well, well here, hang on. Before you before you do yeah. that, I just want to because I've been getting off on all these tangents as I do. Um, yeah. Just go back to your original question. How do you handle talking to people who might not be as versed in these things as you? Yeah. I think pointing some of this out is helpful for them, right? Yeah. Understanding, like, a even the comparisons I just made, which are very real to my own life and my own friend groups, right? Yeah. Like, you can pick your own, uh, you know, pick a movie series, pick a movie, pick a TV series, pick a whatever, right? Yeah. Whatever form of media that, happens in in stages that you need to understand the whole thing to understand parts of it yeah. we can do the same thing with certain ideas or certain theological constructs right mm -hmm. um so understanding that i'll just use an example understanding that um uh rapture hasn't been a theological idea for more than maybe a few hundred years yeah. at most or even dispo free new um, views haven't been around for very long. Like understanding those histories and how they interact with other things is helpful in maybe even defending why you don't believe them. Um, yeah. And I don't think that they've only been around for so long is a great defense of them yeah. not true. Uh, I, I do think that the greater ideas are going to stick around longer. Uh, but, you know, um, so I, I think when we approach people who may differ with us and don't haven't studied as much as us is um, and this isn't to do it to be arrogant. Um, again, if you can if you can do something a la Peterson where you're like, hey, like I've thought about this for a long time and here's what I've drawn, but like I, I know that I don't know all of it and like here's what I know. And if you have anything to give back to what I'm saying, then like fine. And also part of this is like, this was my struggle with debating about Adam and Eve was that not very many people, I don't think anybody in my discussion board for my class re recorded the evidence that I put forward. Everyone was just like, no, your perspective on it is incorrect. Yeah. No one told me why they thought that was incorrect with the evidence I laid out. Mm -hmm. But even making like, being like, hey, hey, look, look, look. Like, I'm cool with you disagreeing with me, but if we're going to discuss this, like, I'm trying to bring things to you. So, like, if you don't know what to do with them, just say, I don't know what to do with it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's something I've had to be like, dude, uh, things drop in my lap, like, Swamadas is theological Adam Eve. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with that. Like, it breaks my boxes. So, yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like, but making ground rules, if you're going to have a longer debate with somebody or see them more often. Um, is also very helpful of like, okay, we're getting off into this thing. Like that's not really the point of what we're talking about. So like, let's get back to this. Yeah. Um, and also just, if you're if you're able to expose them to like, look, I've read this portion that like I agree with, but there's, you know, 20 other books I can list you that are written on this topic that play with this idea. New Perspective is a great example. Like yeah. I've read a, a bit of N.T. Wright. I've yeah. never read Sanders um, and uh, there's one other big, big Dunn. name I'm missing. Done. I've never read J.E. Done. Yeah. So like I'm missing so much in the new perspective conversation. So whenever yeah. I have that, I always preface it like, look, I don't know a whole lot about this. So like, here's, here's what I got. Yeah. Um, now it's, it's tough to debate that, especially with the Bible with somebody who's fixed on a certain view of scripture. So then when you talk about deconstructing that view of scripture, it's very difficult. Um, yeah. With scripture itself and not just theological ideas, I would say, like my struggle with my friends in my classes, like you, you have like the way you're going to convince me, and this is how Heiser has been such a convincing argument. Like he's yeah. laid out so many convincing arguments for me. Is like you have to use the text. Yeah. Like if we're going to argue about the text. You got to use it. That's yeah. That should be a rule. And like, we can bring up cultural examples. We can bring up other stuff, 
but ultimately you got to funnel it to this is like the postmodern class in me coming out like if you're going to prove it you have to use the text like at at the end of the day that's where we're saying we get this from so like you're gonna we're gonna have to use it and if if you don't think i'm using it well enough then like tell me like but but like let's not then make the debate about some we can talk about interpretation but let's make sure we're talking about it within the text and not uh this is something i love that heiser talks about it he's like so so many people have interpretations where it's like it works in this one spot and like that's great because you made it work in these five verses but yeah. i love an interpretation that works here and works here and works yeah. here with mm -hmm. the same ideas so yeah. anyway uh I, and all of that is like in tone like i've had conversation with my uncle where it's like we were both getting like very heated and it was like not not humble um yep. and it started in a, in a place where i did not want to have that conversation it was like it was an adam and eve conversation and it started like the conversation started about the nature of mythology and i was like oh gosh let's not start here let's start somewhere else yep. um so yeah I mean, I'm not great at it, but I, those are things I found is, is if you can understand where they are, maybe use that as a tool to help you build from where you where you're going. Yeah. Um, if it's about something within the text, use the text. And if they're going to argue with you, that has to be the rule. Like, look, I'm cool arguing with you, but you have to use this. Yeah. If we're going to debate about this thing, like this is what we're debating, right? Yeah. And we can't we can't debate. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we can't debate, I know you haven't seen it, but like we're not going to debate character change in Breaking Bad by you bringing up uh, um, Brian Cranston's role in Malcolm in the Middle. Like, yeah, it yeah. isn't going to work, yeah. right? Because you're not dealing with the central thing. So, uh, yeah. That, so anyway, yeah. But you wanted to talk about interpretation because that's a big part of when you argue the text yeah what well, about i was i was referencing uh trans english interpretation translation yeah. sorry in, you know you're good uh, and every but every translation is an interpretation yes no i will that was gonna be <laughs> I this. um yeah is that you, you're right every translation is an interpretation um and every single every single word can mean in hebrew multiple things in english yeah um or at least most of them can and so every time you read a translation, you the translator is picking and choosing one of those meanings, really. Um, yeah. Sometimes they can try to communicate multiple at the same time, but that's pretty difficult. But it's We have words to, in English that are layered too, depending on meaning, yeah. but yeah. not yeah. as much as Hebrew because there's not, literally less words. Yeah, so. not really as much as Hebrew. Um, and so the... The translator has to pick a word that they think adequately represents what is being communicated here um, and then they can have different agendas and i don't mean agenda in a bad way but in a good way so different agendas like am i going to try to goals do what goals might be a better yeah. word yeah goals may, might be a better word um am i trying to um let's say so esv versus niv yeah. ESV is a word for word mm -hmm. or as close to it as possible. NIV is a thought for thought or as close to it as possible, right? So ESV's goal is to take every single word and translate it to an equally equipped, like an equivalent word in English. NIV is- Which is why to... ESV can read clunky. Yeah, exactly. And then NIV takes the entire thought and tries to translate that thought as efficiently as possible and to, to accurately represent what's being communicated. Um, and which is why NIV is a bit more smooth at times, but NIV doesn't always pick up on the nuances of specific words that are being used Yeah, as much as the ESV does. And so both of those translations have a goal. And so I was telling somebody, um, anytime you so, so we have this fascination i think in the american church about um about you know let's read a read the bible in a year or um mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Read as, like read as much of it as possible. Let's read the whole thing. And what I was telling them is that's not a good goal because it's almost like listening to that pro proclamation sermon again, as opposed to the, the question sermon. The text doesn't get in you. You're not doing anything with it. You're just rushing past it. And so what I said is probably the better study method if you really want the Bible to impact you and the way you live your life is to read the same chapter or same section. I wouldn't even say chapter. Read the same large section in literary context mm -hmm. repetitively in multiple translations. Yeah. Because multiple translations are more likely going to bring out different aspects of the original language. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're going to um, allow you to digest the same sort of story multiple times. So I think that's the best way to, to study. And a... Um, the importance of understanding what translations you're using uh, because each different translation has a different goal. Yes, I agree. Uh, we've got about okay. um, are you since we're already been discussing a bunch about the nature of scripture and yeah. how we approach it. Are you cool if we forego our bigger topic to talk yeah. about inspiration? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. And uh, we can, you, it also give me more time to study. Yeah. Uh, uh, or, or if you're free next week or the week after, we can, we can go through. Be. Yeah. Jonah. Um, yeah. So I guess, sorry guys, you can look forward to that next week. We will talk about Jonah. Um, yeah. I wanted to talk about, we talked about, um, Talk about inerrancy last week, maybe ruffle a few feathers, hopefully. Um. <laughs> Real quick, though. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, on that topic, I, I have, well, as a transition, but go ahead. I have something yeah. I want to read. Um, I wanted to get your opinion on something real quick that's very similarly related to this. Um, how do you see inerrancy squaring up against infallibility? Are those the in, same thing? infallibility as in uh and then there's no like fallacies no flaw or yeah no. fallacy. i i feel like they're the same the same the different way to say the same thing yeah see i've thought that for quite some time and i had a conversation with somebody else who um differentiated the two but we didn't have a very long conversation about it. So I just wanted to yeah, see. Yeah, if someone has a good differentiation, I'd like to hear it. Um, yeah. I, I, I probably to... still think it's not very useful, but. Yeah. I, may, I may have to <laughs> talk to them um, to see what they, what they think more. Anyway. Um, So yeah, we talked about inerrancy last week and we, I said a few times that I think the way that you, you view uh, inspiration affects how you look at inerrancy. Yeah. And so now I'd like to give some hot takes, uh, not necessarily hot takes, but some thoughts on how to look at inspiration. If we're going to say that inerrancy is a useless argument for the authority of the Bible, uh, or maybe to put it nicer, a very unhelpful way to think about the Bible's authority, then what do we think about inspiration? Um, and... I'm actually writing a paper on this for my systematic theology class on nice. the nature of inspiration. So uh, I have my, so people don't think that I'm just pulling these definitions out of my butt. I have my, syst my air, I just dropped another book. How many books over here? Uh, I have my Erickson's uh, 
theolo Christian theology textbook for my this math theology class. I have it open to the chapter on on theories of inspiration. Uh, I'm again, I'm not lying here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna like. I don't like to make up things. Okay. Um, I'm going to read through some of these. There's five major theories. Um, and then we can talk about them. And I might end by talking about heat, no, no, not in front of the camera. Heat ends incarnational model of inspiration, which I think is very helpful. Um, so, how do you feel about that as a preface to this conversation? That sounds great. Being prepared with so, resources. What's, uh, what's kind of funny is, so my first semester, I took Christian theology, and yeah. um, in that, I ended up writing a paper on biblical authority. And in that paper, I, um, I had to, it was actually a disputation. So it was like Augustinian, Aquinian format. Um, and I had to um, write about like I touched on like infallibility or inerrancy mm -hmm. um inspiration and all of this stuff and I think my views have actually changed a little bit since then so I'm gonna have to revisit that paper um, I wish that I had done so before this conversation um now I'm the one that's prepared yeah and I'm not <laughs> as well, I'm not as well read on um or well thought I guess on inspiration as I am Inerrancy. I'll okay. Leave. Well, you were you were leading last week's conversation, so I guess it's my turn. Yeah. Uh, all right. So he actually from one to five, he talks about them from like the most liberal view to the most conservative view. I want to go the opposite way because I think it's a bit more helpful. Okay. Um, so I will just I'll read some of these, and if you want to uh, butt in and. Yeah give some thoughts on the specific one I'm reading about, go ahead. So we'll start with this, the dictation theory, and I'll just quote, he has a paragraph in each, so I'll just quote the paragraphs here. The verbal theory insists that the Holy Spirit's in, oh, sorry, that's, that's verbal, not dictation. Dictation and verbal kind of go together though. Yeah. The dictation theory is the teaching that God's act, God actually dictated the Bible to the writers. Passages where the spirit is depicted as telling the author precisely what to write uh, are regarded as applying to the entire Bible. Different authors did not write in distinctive styles. Most adherents of the verbal view do take great pains to dis disassociate themselves from the dictation theorist. There are, however, some who would accept this designation, uh, this designation of their view. Although John Calvin and other reformers do use the expression dictation when describing inspiration, it seems unlikely that they meant what is usually denoted by this term. All right, then we'll go to the verbal theory. The verbal theory insists, uh, go ahead. So, um, if I'm understanding this correctly, dictation theory is essentially God spoke every single word to the people writing with no differentiation in style or um, wasn't that a clause that was there? Yeah, it was... Um... Different authors did not write in distinctive styles. Most adherents to the verbal theory do not. Do, yeah. Okay. Um, so, passages where scripture is depicted as telling the author precisely what to write are regarded as applying to the entire Bible. Different authors did not write with different styles. Well, there we go. The theory already fails. So. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, if you hold that clause, theory fails. If you release that clause, then I'm a bit more willing to at least give the theory some credence yeah um, on a miraculous basis right yeah but i think it's relatively obvious the bible is written in different styles just by looking at it mm -hmm. um, yeah but if you want to say that god dictated every single word then but those can be in different styles i'm at least willing to hear it you know what i mean yeah. okay verbal theory this is pretty this verbal theory is pretty common uh at least among people that i know yeah. Verbal theory insists that the Holy Spirit's influence extends beyond the direction of thoughts to the selection of words used to convey the message. The work of the Holy Spirit is so intense, catch that wording, the work of the Holy Spirit is so intense 
that each word is the exact word God once used at that point to express the message. Ordinarily, great care is taken to insist that this is not dictation, however. So my response to this um, is that we do have textual errors in the versions that we have, and we've already had that conversation. Um, so um, you couldn't call it inspired. If that's your definition of inspired, you couldn't call it inspired as we have it. It would be inspired as it was originally given, and then as the errors crept in slowly. Um, now, again, I think we can relatively well we can do a relatively good job of piecing together what we have. But um, there's also, I mean, one of the biggest debates in the Jewish context in the first century was based on a textual variant error. And Jesus actually weighs in on this. It's the debate about divorce. Mm -hmm. uh, the two words are flipped in some textual strains. And because of not even the wrong words, but the two words being in opposite order, determines how you theologically translate a passage about divorce what what was the do you remember what the words were what I, i'm remembering that passage i don't remember the the debate was about divorce and the nature of divorce and jesus talks about adam well he talks about in the beginning um when yeah. male and female were made and yeah. god gave the command right i've had people use that as a defense for jesus thinking adam and eve are literal and i'm like no if you read the passage he never names adam and eve but yeah. anyway yeah. okay go on so um, I don't remember the words exactly in either the Hebrew or the English, but the Hebrew is actually a bit, when you say the Hebrew literally, it actually requires a bit of interpretation to understand the, the context. But what it's essentially getting at is, can you divorce your wife for any and every reason, right? Patriarchal culture, can you divorce yeah. your wife for any and every reason? Because the man was the only one who could issue the certificate of divorce, or does it have to be um, a specific, like a reason like adultery or um, yeah. some other act that, you know, breaks the marriage covenant. Um, and so just because of the simple word flip, the, um, there was a debate caused this entire so like, verbal debate. theory is kind of at a weird impasse with this. Yeah. It, moment. it doesn't exactly hold on especially to, um, to us as we, as we have the Bible now. Yeah. All right. Here's the dynamic theory. This is the one that I would probably hold to. It's the one I'll probably argue for in my paper. Okay. The dynamic theory emphasizes the combination of divine and human elements in the process of inspiration and the writing of the Bible. The spirit of God's words, of God's works by, the spirit of God works by directing the writer to the thoughts or concepts and allow and allowing the writer's own distinctive personality to come into play in the choice of words and expressions. Thus, the writer will give expressions to the divinely directed thoughts in a way unique, uniquely characteristic of that person. The um, yeah, I, I would probably hold to this or something very similar um, simply because okay. this accounts for distinctive styles um, this accounts for the authors I, if i'm understanding this correctly this accounts for the authors god giving the author freedom a little bit to work within the their context and yeah um, the, yeah. the phrase here is the spirit of God works by directing the writer to the thoughts or concepts and allowing the writer's own distinctive personality to come through into play in the choice of words and expressions. Yeah. So the, the thing that comes to mind here is um, in, I believe it's Exodus, might be Numbers, God tells Moses, pretty sure it's Exodus, God tells Moses, yep. go write down. Yep. That's what? the first mention of the writing of the Bible in the Bible, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Um, and so God tells Moses, go write down what happened here. And it doesn't say, and then God directed Moses' hand or God whispered in Moses' ear. It yep. just says, God told Moses to write it down. And so Moses wrote it down. Right. And so I think even the Bible testifies against the other two 
in this regard um, and aligns more obviously and um, easily with with this theory would be my yeah. reaction with with what we actually see in scripture about the writing yeah. of the bible yeah all right we got two more this other one i i kind of agree with the the first one i don't really agree with. all right so here's the second to last one the illumination theory the illuminate illumination theory maintains that there is an influence of the holy spirit upon the authors of scripture but involving only a heightened of their normal powers there is no special communication of truth or guidance in what is written, but merely an increased sensitivity and perceptivity with regards to spiritual matters. It is not unlike the effect of stimulant of stimulants students sometimes take to heighten their awareness or amplify the mental processes. Thus, the work of inspiration is different only in degree, not in kind. Uh, from the Spirit's work of all believers, the result of this type of inspiration is increased ability to discover truth. Okay, so you've been exposed this, to this. This gives problems to things like prophecy. I mean, that sort of depends on your perspective of prophecy. True. What's your perspective of prophecy? I'm, I'm more referencing things in the prophets will say, and the word of the Lord is thus, or in the Lord speak, or... Okay. The word of the Lord is. Okay. They seem to be speaking for God. Things that they have, albeit. Yeah. Heard well. From God. So yeah. is this? Is there? Is there? Is there? Words of God heightened spiritual sensitivity that they have, because of the Holy Spirit, and that's how it gets. I, like I don't know. It gets really weird. Well, and here's here's another question too, right? Do does every single part of the Bible have to fit within one framework? Sure. Right? Can yeah. can the prophets be operating in a dictation or, or a, a or a verbal and the authors of Genesis or yeah, you know, Moses when he's told to to go write down what happened at the battle, can they be operating in what was it dynamic theory? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't see why. God doesn't have the freedom to allow different situations, different, you know, workarounds and, and different methods of, of getting to the root of what's going on. This is that... my struggle with systematic theology. Yeah. Okay. All right. We got one more. I'll read it and then we can discuss and I'll have this on hand. So if you want to reference it, we can. Yeah. This is the intuition theory. It's a little bit like the illumination theory, just one step down. Okay. The intuition theory makes inspiration largely a high degree of insight. Some within left-wing liberalism hold such a view. Inspiration is the functioning of a high gift, perhaps almost like an artistic ability, but nonetheless a natural endowment, a permanent possession. The scripture writers were religious geniuses. I would not argue with that statement, the Hebrew people had a particular gift for their religious, just as some groups seem to have special attitude for mathematics or languages. On this basis, inspiration of the scripture writers was essentially no different from that of the great religious and philosophical thinkers such as Plato and Buddha. The Bible then is great, is great religious literature reflecting the Hebrew people's spiritual experience. I would say this is Peterson's view of inspiration, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I I think you're right there. Um, he would he would couch it more though as like humanity's book rather than just the Hebrews book, which maybe yeah. might might not you know might be wrong, might be right on his part. I don't know, but I think that's how I've heard him phrase it. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one thing that I think is apparent is that. Parts of it are definitely true, right? Yeah. The prophets were artistic geniuses, like absolute genius. Whether or not you want to say that was naturally endowed to them or, or God bestowed it upon them miraculously, the and I get that that's sort of the distinction between this and the other. But I mean, I, I think it's worth saying that the prophets and really everyone who wrote anything in the Bible was an artistic genius. I one time saw a video on YouTube that was trying to refute um, Christianity 
and uh, it was an atheist talking and he was going off about how um, the Bible was a poor literary work. And that was like 0.5 of 10 or something. I turned the video off right there because I was like, if you believe that the Bible is not a well-designed literary work, you, you obviously don't know anything. Um, so the, um, you're, yeah, I mean, it, I can see aspects of this that are true. I don't know if I would go as far as it does. Yeah, just think of inspiration as some sort of natural, yeah, the term natural endowment, like yeah, like being good at sports or being good at art. Yeah, right. That takes. I think there's there's a distinct there's a distinction that needs to be made between miracle and natural, right? So when people try to prove that the ten plagues could have happened in Egypt naturally. I think that takes away from the story. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like, if it wasn't blood, if it was red algae that flowed down from the, you know, the, the mountains or wherever where the water came from, that doesn't, that ruins the fact that it was a miracle. Yeah. So I think if you're gonna try to claim inspiration, there has to be something miraculous about it, right? At least that's what I would think. Uh, maybe if your if your goal is to say that the Bible isn't uh, God's word, whatever we mean by that, yeah. then you would take an in, intuition view of more or less. You'd probably take an intuition view of yeah. inspiration. And I would because say that it has nothing to do with the supernatural aspect of the Bible yeah. or the spiritual aspect of the Bible. Yeah in terms of a uh, intervening of God on, on the people of, who make the text, at the very least. Um, that doesn't seem to take place at all. All the other theories posit some level of that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it depends on, you know, how you think about, again, how you think about the Bible, how you think about how it's constructed, how you think about the writers of the Bible. Um, something that I, that I like to use as a example of this. And this more has to do with uh, writings by more so in the New Testament, I guess. Um, yeah. More than like, I'm not using this argument for prophets or for or for things of that nature. Um, yeah. Psalms could be part of this too, for sure. Um, yeah. So basically every category except um, prophetic, except prophetic, it may be some historic. Yeah. Um, so I have, now I got to get my keyboard back. Um, I wrote a little, I won't be reading this, but I wrote a little response to the reading we did for, for the week when we had to read about inspiration. And this is a story of, I've heard that I think is very interesting. Uh, I like to talk about this, not that I'm an intuition uh, holder to inspiration, but I think couching inspiration a little bit in terms of how we talk about inspiration in a secular point of view, is quite interesting. Okay, um, we talk about this with arts. Like, oh, I don't feel inspired. I don't have the muse. Whatever we mean by muse, as well. Like, there's like, if you investigate how artistic people talk about inspiration, yeah, it's very spiritual. Hmm. It's very spiritual. Huh. You're right. I never had to of... talk about like, oh my gosh, I had this revelation that like. Yeah. You know, this right um uh king king has great great thoughts on the views i think they're also hilarious um hilarious in that they're actually funny because they're true not because they're ridiculous um but he always says the muse comes after a hard work or comes when you agree to do the hard work not because you're in the shower and you suddenly get into uh but he also characters his muse as a as a like a, a begrudging fat man with like dust and not like some pretty woman uh but uh where was i going oh he talks about when he's got the idea for carrie um that he was sit, he was doing janitorial work at school and he was working with some other guy and they were like um he had had the idea for like a telepathy character 
And then they were like unloading the bins in the woman's bathroom of all the tampons. And he it like hit him like, oh, adolescent girl and, you know, telekinesis. And he, he always talks about a, a good story idea is two very unrelated ideas that crash together and then you have a, you can start a story. Um, so all that's groundwork to what I'm talking. So just, just to say, how we talk about inspiration artistically is very spiritual. And I think it's an interesting corollary to talking about biblical inspiration, especially when it comes to uh, things like even Genesis or especially the New Testament and Paul and the apostles writing their letters. Okay. Uh, I'll use the another artistic example of someone because I love his quote. His name's Rod, Rob uh, Gardner. He is a Latter-day Saints composer, actually. So take for that what you will. Uh, but he wrote a concert film called Lamb of God. It came out a few, well, it was, I think he finished it a few years ago, but it came out this last Easter. Um, and it was in theaters, concert films, like he wrote all the music and then they put film to it, but there's no dialogue or anything. Gotcha. Um, but he would talk about how people talk about inspiration and it really pissed him off because he said, you know, people would say, oh, I wrote that in like 10, 15 minutes. And I've had that experience. Like I write a song in 30 minutes and I'm like, wow, that was, that was interesting. Like, the muse was there in the room, right? We were right. having an interesting conversation. And this is even true of the songs though, that have, that's happened to me. He said, my experience with that was so much so, was very different than how people usually talk about it. He said, well, what would happen for me is I would be working on a piece of music for weeks or months and I'd get stuck on it. And then I'd leave it alone for two months and I'd work on something else. And as I was working on something else, or when I finally got to the point where I said, oh, I'm gonna go revisit that thing I was stuck on two months ago, he'd say, I'd, I'd, I'd generally have like be working on it, be at the piano, be playing something, and then it would hit me. Oh, I know how to fix this. Right. And then he'd be like, oh, I'd fix it in, you know, 20 minutes. Yeah. Because I know what to do now. Yeah. But his question was, did I really think about that? Did I really get that inspired that I fixed it in 15 minutes? Or was it the fact that I've been thinking about it for three months straight, even though I hadn't been working on it? Yeah. Where is the inspiration? Is it in the meditation or is it in the instant that I get the key? Yeah. Ooh. So I've got something really good on this. So um, I grew up AG. I think this is why intuition or illumination theory, I think works best in most cases of biblical inspiration. If you're gonna pair it yeah. with uh, artistic inspiration or how we yeah. frame artistic inspiration. There's another one of my examples of like, use something outside of it to help like, this is something I've learned from Gladwell. Is like, you use something outside of a thing to like frame it in a different way. And so like, I don't know, maybe you don't buy my artistic inspiration is like scriptural inspiration, because scriptural inspiration is so, so special and it's like by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, regardless, how we talk about them is super spiritual and how you see Paul, especially writing or the writer of Hebrews, whoever it may have been, writing things in the New Testament. We got to look, sorry, I'm, I'm going to like go on this tangent for a second. So we got to remember, Paul's like, I was the Pharisee of Pharisees. Like, yeah. I, that dude had his Bible memorized. Yeah. Like Jesus had his Bible memorized. All the people that Jesus is debating with had their Bibles memorized. Probably a lot of his disciples had a majority of the Bible memorized, right? Like, yep. okay. So there is a deep, deep knowledge that, that Paul, if we're going to use Paul as an example, he yeah. already has of the Jewish scriptures, already has of the Old Testament. So as he is writing his letters, he, this is the way that he like get into hermeneutical trouble now because he interprets it in weird ways. But like mm -hmm. the reason he can do that, the reason he could seem to like think on the fly, like Peterson with the Bible in his letters and why he's so tangential is because it's so in him yeah. that it's he doesn't even have to like reference it it's just there yeah and so you so my argument would be okay so is paul's revelations 
about scripture or or or, revel, or like instruction to yeah. certain churches using these references is that like i would argue yes probably the holy spirit has a part to play in like yeah. what he's meditating on that day or what like what he ends up connecting it with later like or whatever yeah but <clears throat> there is a certain prerequisite to the fact that paul knew this thing by heart and the same right. thing when rob gardner talks about like I fixed it in 15 minutes. Well, that comes with a prerequisite that like you'd been working on it for two months straight and couldn't figure it out. Yeah. Whereas like I sit down to write a song about something and it's like I write it in half an hour and it's like, oh yeah, look, because you've actually been thinking about that like concept for two months. You just haven't given yourself any time to write anything about it. So like yep. the constraints of making a rap song like help push that out of you because you know that you're constrained to this form. Like any anyway. But like same thing for me, even if I haven't written it before, I've been thinking about whatever it is for mm -hmm. a while. So like, now I'm like, okay, I can release all my thoughts about whatever. Yeah, no, I think that's really good. And what I think that's, I think it pairs really nicely with my own experience with um, interactions with the Holy Spirit. Uh, yeah. So to get, you know, you and I have a lot of, really heady conversations about theology and stuff like that, but to get sort of more directly spiritual um, for a second. I grew up AG, like we've talked about, um, Pentecostal church, Pentecostal tradition, and we have a big emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And tongues specifically. Do what? I said tongues specifically. Tongues specifically. But yes. And I differentiate myself with some AG thought on, on that specifically. Uh, sorry, I've got this light right in my face. Let me screw it up. Um, okay. So um, the sun's moved a little bit. So I, um, I grew up in a tradition where it was not uncommon to um, I'm, have, listening, I'm just looking for yeah. a quote. Yeah, no, you're good. Um, to have people say to you, you know, oh, I feel like God is telling me this, or I feel like God is, you know, leading me to say this to you or whatever. And I do think that those are genuine things. I do think that the Holy Spirit acts like that today. People, um, people said, spoke a word to you. What, yes. What we would say. Yeah. And um, and I believe that I've done that to other people as well. I believe that as I matured in my faith and I grew, um, I believe that God would, um, especially in my role as youth pastor, if I was meeting kids down by the altar um, for prayer, I believe that God would, um, the Holy Spirit would speak to me sometimes to tell them certain things. When I say speak to me, I don't mean like I was audibly hearing a voice, but I feel like just yeah. gut instinct, this is what I'm supposed to say kind of thing. And I think that is a form of inspiration. And I think that there's probably a large part of that goes into the writing of scripture as well. Um, but what I've realized is the more that I practiced that, I don't want to say intuition, but that, that gut feeling of listening to the spirit, listening to the Holy Spirit speak, the more I realized that he had less and less to say to me. Hmm. And what I mean by that is the, the more that I got familiar with listening to the spirit, the less he had to tell me. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. He could say, um, this person is struggling with this. Go say what you always say when someone's struggling with that. And I could just go do it. He wouldn't have to give me every word. He would give me the topic. And then hmm. I would take from there. Hmm. And so, and, and this is my own, you know, religious experience. Yeah. I know a lot of people will scoff and a lot of people will laugh and that's fine. You can. Um, I don't because it, it's, it's sort of bewildering to me still that as, as I grew into the, as I became familiar with, and for a while I thought, oh my gosh, I'm doing this thing where I'm operating in my own strength and I'm, you know, being that worldly person who's giving. And then I realized, no, God's growing me to another level of yeah. relationship with him. 
I know him in this area so much. All he has to say is one word to me and I can go do it. Mm -hmm. So how does that idea of inspiration and hearing from God play into the writing of scripture? Did the writers of scripture become so familiar with God and who he was that he could speak one word to them and they could write entire books? Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not arguing for that. But what I'm saying is when you really get down in, in the, the nitty gritty of it, there's, there's a distinction there to be made. Yeah. Well, so I don't know. What do, you, what do you think of that? I mean, just as a personal testimony, I think it's pretty awesome. Uh, and B, like, yes, I, I would wholly affirm that kind of view of maybe you're pushing me towards an illumination theory with that, but like, that is very much like what you would think of as like light bulb. Yeah. Moment. yeah, like, yeah. But it's God given. It's not that you, um, I mean, you might've had experiences um, that, you know, prepared you. And this is actually much akin to Heiser's view of inspiration is he's like, I think God shaped and molded these authors for the things he was going to have them do. Yeah. Everything well, they read, every I mean, person they came in contact with, like, like who else is going to write two thirds of our New Testament? Yeah. The guy that could say, I used to kill y'all. Yeah. Because I believe in holy war and having zeal for the Lord, which like writes first to first chapter about like zeal for the Lord and that conception. Is, I'd never heard it before. It is so good in a way to think about Paul, but like, wow. like, no, like, and I was so fervently for God and for this book that I was against Jesus. And now he is, I counted all his loss. Yeah. Right? Like what a man to know these things so well, and then yeah. to have it just flip because of, because of a supernatural experience yeah. and meeting the risen Christ mm -hmm. that he his life changes and then he can use all the things he used to use as a religious fervor and for his um his uh hubris and his pride that he then uses to serve those who need it the most like yeah, yeah. i yeah i think that it's i think it's you can hold it for sure yeah. and totally affirm that God is involved in writing scriptures just in a different way than you might have ever thought about them before. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you have any comments to that, but I have uh, one more quote I want to read uh, sure. to close this off before we get off. Uh, this is from Pete N's book, Incarnation and Inspiration. This book actually got acquired from Westminster Seminary. Um, or from Western Seminary, which is really funny if you want to, you can Google about that. Um, he wrote it while he was still there. So in the intro, he's talking about like all the people he's talked to in, in school that have helped him write this book. He is like, if you have a certain perception of Pete as like some weird off the wall liberal, just read the first two chapters of this book. It's definitely not his goal. It's, I'll read uh, like two, two paragraphs of it now. Um, he, he has actually the shirts from him. Uh, the Bible's not people. It says the Bible's not a rule book, um, and yeah, I think it's it's been very helpful. And like, as you can see, I'm about halfway through. Yeah, reading this for my um, for my paper, I'm going to read right on uh, inspiration. So this is his central like analogy throughout the book, and I think it's a pretty helpful way to use what you just talked about, what we've talked about, these different theories of inspiration, to give it again an analogy something else different than my artistic analogy um something a bit more theological to help frame how we think about inspiration he yeah. says this this is at the end of the first chapter i believe he says i do not want to suggest that difficult problems have simple solutions what i want to offer instead is a proper starting point for discussing these problems one that if allowed to run its course, will reorient us to see these problems in a better light. 
This starting point can be traced back to the early centuries of the church and can be applied to modern issues with considerable profit. The starting point for our discussion is the following. As Christ is both God and human, so is the Bible. In other words, we are to think of the Bible analogously to how Christians think about Jesus. We are, in other words, we are to think about the Bible analogously to how Christians think about Jesus. Yeah. Christians confess that Jesus is both God and human at the same time. He is not half God and half human. He's not sometimes one and other and other times the other. He is not essentially one and only apparently the other. Rather, one is this rather one one of the central doctrines of Christian faith worked out as far back as the council of some place I can pronounce. Uh, El, El Cedan, yeah. Uh, in AD 451 is that Jesus is 100% God and 100% human at the same time. This way of thinking of Christ is analogous to thinking about the Bible. In the same way that Jesus is, must be both God and human, the Bible is also a divine and human book. Although Jesus was God with us, he is still completely assumed, he still completely assumed the cultural trappings of the world in which he lived. In fact, this is what is implied in God with us. Perhaps this is part of what the author of Hebrews had in mind when he said that Christ was made like them, fully human in every way. Jesus was a first century Jew, the language of the time, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic were his languages. Their customs were his customs. He fit, he belonged, he was one of them. That's really good, that's really good. That's Pete's incarnational analogy. Um. Yeah, now I'm now I'm seeing the title of the book in the new light and seeing the way he. I've actually heard Tim Mackey t make similar statements. Oh yeah, his whole statement about the it is both a human and divine is like totally from Tim's he, language. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, it. Um, in fact, the video that I heard Tim, where Tim mentions that, is actually the video that I was looking for when I found you. Uh, which is kind of funny, um, but but yeah, you're. I think that's that's so beautiful. We have to look at it as both a human and divine book. Um, I think the Bible itself is an example of what can be when God and man work together. Mm. Mm. And we we can create something that is as beautiful and complex, and yet so lovingly simple at the same time when when we align ourselves with god and partner with him and what he's really wanting to do in the world you know yeah well, I, don't, I can't think of a better quote to end it on. So look out, tell them there. look out for my worldview. Cloudy when you sinking, got you thinking it's a whirlpool. Caesar in your pockets, you can't see who's in your pockets. But Stevie's inner visions touch your eyes and make the world move. Wifey bob her head and make her curls move. Crown jewel is character, and this ain't immortality with fairy dust. Never land, never say I never gave you hands. If I can't give them back, then you look.